The Emperor leered at the various ships at the Naval Review. He was here for his grandmother, but was instantly taken with a particular ship. His heart beat faster as the ship zipped past him, gliding on the water. The specs, the design, the engine, all of it was perfect, and he was instantly awestruck as he held his jaw from falling agape. The Emperor took a sharp breath in and looked to his comrades. In a voice filled with both anticipation and envy, he stated, We must have some of these. Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday. My name is Eleanor. Just a quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story may be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Okay, everyone, let's get into it. When we think of ocean liners, the majority of us probably envision British four stackers like Lusitania or Titanic, but Germany actually had a large stake in the ocean liner game at one point as well, making major technological advancements in the shipping world. SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa is a perfect example of such advancements. Let's start with a bit of background information to set the scene. Toward the end of the 1800s, the UK was still dominant on the seas with enormous shipping companies like the White Star Line and the Cunard Line providing tremendous services with their beautiful ocean liners. Emperor Wilhelm II of the German Empire wanted to consolidate his influence on the water and rise above his British contemporaries since he'd been given more influence by his grandfather, Wilhelm I, who'd formed the German Empire in 1871. Emperor Wilhelm II was at the Naval Review in honor of his grandmother Queen Victoria's Jubilee, and there he was in awe of British ships, particularly by the newest, largest ocean liner by the White Star Line, the technologically savvy and gorgeous RMS Teutonic. He was also impressed with the fact that Teutonic and her sister Majestic could easily be turned into auxiliary cruisers in times of war, with the Emperor audibly saying something to the effect of, quote, we must have some of these. So, he would have some of those. A.G. Vulcan of Stettin would be employed to create a new ocean liner for the Neudeutscher Lloyd Line, also known as the German Lloyd Line, which was one of the two German maritime companies that had been influential and highly profitable. The new ship was going to be based off of ships like Teutonic, and she was to be named after Wilhelm I, being named SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa. She was the largest and longest liner afloat, other than the Great Eastern, which was being used as a billboard and showboat. By the way, if you want an episode on the Great Eastern, let me know. SS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grossa was laid down in 1896 by A.G. Vulcan in Stetten, the first of four sister ships that would be built between 1903 and 1907. She was launched on May 4, 1897 in the presence of the Imperial family, with the Emperor himself blessing the ship and honoring his grandfather with the ship's name. She was completed at Bremerhaven and passed her sea trials shortly after that. Her service history would begin with her maiden voyage on September 19, 1897, but before we get into that, we are going to take a brief look at her specs. SS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grossa would be the first ocean liner to feature four funnels, and she is widely accepted as the first super liner. With her sleek design and innovation, she marked a change for the coming century that would bring about ocean liners like the Olympic class liners that are so iconic and well known. Having four funnels was a sign of size, safety, strength, and luxury that instantly drew in customers willing to pay extra for a bougie, posh experience. In terms of tonnage, her tonnages were 14,349 gross register tons and 5,521 net register tons. She displaced 24,700 metric tons or 24,300 long tons. And in imperial measurements, she was 649 feet long, had a beam of 66 feet wide, a draft of 27 feet and 11 inches, and a depth of 35.8 feet deep. In metric measurements, that's a length of 198 meters long, a beam of 20.1 meters wide, a draft of 8.51 meters, and a depth of 10.9 meters deep. She spanned four decks, being able to carry 1,506 passengers after a refit in 1900 to begin carrying third-class passengers. 
This was because the immigrant trade was so profitable for her sister ships, so she was built to match. Her crew started at 488, but after the refit in 1913, this was increased to 800 crew. Her code letters were QGLF, and in 1913 she gained the call sign DKW. Let's take a look at propulsion, shall we? For propulsion, she was equipped with two four-cylinder triple expansion steam engines powering steam turbines that turned two screws. This engine was capable of putting out 3,094 nominal horsepower, which is an early 19th century rule of thumb used to estimate the power of steam engines, or 33,000 indicated horsepower, which is also 25,000 kilowatts. This engine setup was on what is called the Schlick system, and it prevented movement from being passed down the ship and reduced uncomfortable vibrations. She could travel an average service speeds of 22.5 knots, which is 41.7 kilometers per hour or 25.9 miles per hour with this engine setup, which was just incredible for the time. Even today, that's pretty damn fast. But don't worry, you can take it slow and enjoy this video. If you're enjoying this video, leave me a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and let me know down in the comments section below. With that out of the way, let's look at some of her design aspects. Her funnels are her most notable feature. Not only was she the first to have four funnels and that made her stand out, but she stands out to ship fanatics because of the spacing of these funnels, which is unequal. People unfairly began to associate the safety of a ship by the number of stacks she had, and as we know with Lusitania and Titanic, this can be a massive mistake. It was a widely spread belief, however, with some patrons refusing to board ships with fewer than four funnels. Safety was something shipping companies were trying to ensure, since ocean travel was far less safe back in the Edwardian period compared to today. It's still not perfect today, but it is better than it once was. Though the four funnels looked exquisite, like most four funnel ships, she didn't need them. She had two uptake shafts that split into two sections to connect to her four funnels, hence the odd spacing between the funnels. Not only was she the first four funnel beauty, but she was also the first ocean liner to have a commercial wireless telegraphy system when the Marconi company installed one aboard her in February of 1900. This also helped ensure the safety for passengers, knowing that messages could reach ports. She was capable of carrying 1,506 passengers split into three classes, and it broke down into 206 first class, 226 second class, and 1,704 third class. Her decor was in the style of Baroque Revival and was overseen solely by architect Johann Pope, which was unique since most interiors were designed by multiple designers. He also oversaw the interiors of her sister ships. Tapestries, statues, mirrors, gilding, and various portraits of the imperial family were strewn across the interiors of the ship. The first class salon was well known for its gorgeous tapestries and blue seating, and the men's smoking room was made to look like a beautiful German inn. The dining room was capable of holding all of the passengers in one sitting, and it was several decks tall with a massive dome over it. The dining room also featured columns and fixed chairs to the deck, which was typical for ocean liners of the century. She was sleek, beautiful, and ready to set sail. SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa, all shiny and brand new, set out from Bremerhaven for Southampton on September 19, 1897 for her maiden voyage, then heading to New York City. At the time, she had a capacity for roughly 800 third-class passengers, making sure to make bank off immigrant families ready to start a new life in the States. Starting with her maiden voyage, she immediately grabbed attention because of her speed. She successfully gained the Blue Ribbon, which was an unofficial accolade given to the passenger liner crossing the Atlantic Ocean the fastest, and you could get the Blue Ribbon for the west or eastbound crossing, or both. She gained this title in March of 1898, averaging a speed of 22.3 knots, which is 41.3 kilometers per hour and 25.7 miles per hour. With this, Germany gained a new competitive vigor. They wanted large, luxurious, and lightning fast. The previous record holder had been Cunard's RMS Lucania, and being surpassed by the Germans was a surprise that was watched closely by the maritime community. Sadly, Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa would be surpassed by another German ship, Hamburg America Lines SS Deutschland. 
The German people were okay with this turn of events, but the German Lloyd Line was not. And so they ordered a refit in 1900 to make sure they were still the top dogs, even if it wasn't in terms of speed. This is when her wireless telegraphy system was installed, and this emphasized the safety and quality of their prized ocean liner. The German Lloyd line would take it a step further when they announced a baby sister for SS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse in 1901, the Kronzprinz Wilhelm, named in honor of the Crown Prince William, the heir to the German throne. Two more liners were commissioned, thus forming what was called the Four Flyers, similar to the Big Four of the White Star Line. The Four Flyers' name was in reference to the Blue Ribbon, since the ships were considered so fast that they pretty much flew over the ocean. The other two liners were Kaiser Wilhelm II in 1903 and Kronzprinzessin Sicily of 1907, all named after members of the Imperial family. From 1904 to 1907, SS Kaiser Wilhelm II held the eastbound speed record for the Blue Ribbon. RMS Lusitania would take the Blue Ribbon back for the British in 1907. And now we get into the not-so-glamorous side of her career, the accidents. If she was a modern-day car, you'd ask me to show you the car facts, and I'd tell you this. While docked at her quay in Hoboken, New Jersey in June of 1900, SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa caught fire. This fire would go on to kill 100 of her staff that were bravely trying to control the blaze while the ship was towed to safety on the Hudson River. Just six years later, on November 21, 1906, she'd be involved in a collision with Royal Mail Steam Packet Company's ocean liner, RMS Orinoco, while in Cherbourg Harbor in France. In total, three crewmen aboard RMS Orinoco and five passengers on Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa were killed, with Orinoco's clipper bow tearing into the starboard side of Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa's hull. A court of inquiry was pulled together to assess blame, and they found Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa wholly responsible for the accident. If this isn't bad enough, on August 9, 1910, New York City Mayor William J. Gaynor was heading on a European vacation when he was shot on the ship. He died suddenly on a deck chair aboard the RMS Baltic on September 10, 1913, with his old wound being considered a contributing factor to his sudden death. Quickly, ships advanced at the turn of the century, and sadly, SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa was quickly outpaced. With Cunard's RMS Lusitania and RMS Mauritania in 1906, and White Star Line's RMS Olympic in 1911, luxury on the Atlantic had only gotten more modern and more readily available. Because of this, SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa was forced to reinvent herself in 1913, being remodeled instead to only carry third-class passengers to really cash in on the immigrant movement. It was apparent that being the first four-stacker was no longer as appealing as it had once been, and she was seen as an aging option amongst newer, more luxurious four-stackers. From January 26, 1907, she was moved to taking passengers from the Mediterranean Sea to New York, pretty much ending her public career. Now we are getting into World War I and the lead-up. From 1908, German naval captains were warned to prepare for sudden war. Soon after these warnings started, SS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grossa was actually fitted with cannons and turned into an auxiliary cruiser. As tensions rose, the world began to prepare as supply ships started stocking up on weapons and provisions to be converted to armed merchant cruisers. On August 4, 1914, England declared war on Germany following Germany's invasion of Belgium and Luxembourg. SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa was requisitioned for wartime service and turned full on into an armed merchant cruiser, being painted gray and black. Her commander was Captain Raymond, a man said to not only follow the rules of war, but also the rules of mercy. Together, Raymond and Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa got to work sinking ships. Soon, they sent three to the bottom of the Atlantic, to Bulcane, Kaipara, and Nianza. But they did this only after taking all of their occupants aboard, sparing their lives. Further south in the Atlantic, they ran into two passenger ships, Galician and Arlanza. Raymond first wanted to sink both ships, but once he learned that there were women and children aboard, he decided against it, allowing both ships to go unharmed. In the beginning of World War I, there was a widespread belief that the war could be fought with an air of chivalry. However, it soon became apparent this was not the case, and ships would no longer be warned before coming under fire. A glaring case of this is the sinking of RMS Lusitania in 1915. 
SS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grossa steamed ahead toward the west coast of Africa with her coal bunkers almost empty and in desperate need of a refill. She stopped in Rio de Oro, now called Dakla, and here German and Austrian colliers started shoveling coal into her coal bunkers. The colliers worked busily refueling the ship, and our patrons refuel these videos. This episode couldn't be possible without our lovely patrons. Thank you all so much. If you'd like to support the channel and future episodes, go to patreon.com slash shipwrecksunday to join. Okay, let's get into her controversial demise. While still in port and being cold on August 26, 1914, the British cruiser HMS High Flyer creeped onto the scene. Seeing her, Raymond quickly readied his ship and crew for battle and disembarked his prisoners of war, steaming out to engage HMS High Flyer. Soon, a fierce battle began with both ships getting shots on one another and squirreling around in clever maneuvers, going tit for tat and blow for blow. However, it soon came to a dramatic end when SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa ran out of ammo. Here's where the controversy kicks in. According to the Germans, they did not want to let the British capture one of their prized ocean liners, and so Raymond ordered his ship to be scuttled with dynamite that was already in place should they ever need it. For our younger audience members and anyone unaware, scuttling is when a crew deliberately sinks their vessel, typically by opening holes in the hull one way or another. Upon detonating, a massive hole ruptured the hull, causing the once great ocean liner to capsize. According to the British, the story goes a bit differently. The British stood firmly by their belief that gunfire from HMS High Flyer sank SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa, and not intentional scuttling. However, this is debated since Captain Raymond managed to survive the sinking, swim back to shore, and sneak back to Germany by working as a stoker on a neutral ship. Most of his crew were captured and taken to the Amherst internment camp in Nova Scotia until the end of World War I. What we do know for certain is that one British soldier was killed and six were wounded, with casualties and injuries on the German side being unknown. For many large ocean liners, their biggest failings were their enormous fuel consumption and lack of maneuverability. Because of these failings, later in the war, most of these ocean liners were converted from merchant cruisers to hospital ships or troop transport ships, like RMS Mauritania and RMS Aquitania, and HMHS Britannic, which was finished as a hospital ship. RMS Olympic shifted to being a troop transport ship as well, and she'd actually end up sinking a U-boat. SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa went from being the pride of her nation and a feat of engineering to a heap of scrap metal in a shallow grave in a matter of minutes, and it's a damn shame. She was an incredible ship, and without her, we may not have had some of our favorite four-funneled ships that we all hold so dear. Rest in peace to all of those who died in the battle and sinking of SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa. May we never forget such an incredible ocean liner. If you liked that story and wanted to hear something similar, check out our Ocean Liners playlist in the cards. Stay tuned next week for the story of SS Laurentic, the last Ocean Liner built by Harlan and Wolf for the White Star Line, and the last White Star Line ship to be sunk. Thank you for tuning into Shipwreck Sunday, have a great week, and we'll see you next time.